Praise the Lord, everybody. Just a couple of things real quick. Um, no, 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 I'm good. Um, actually, just one thing. The competition is almost over. It's almost over. Um, and the competition I'm talking about is the preachers having to compete with the babies. It's almost over. We're planning. We're going to build a room back there. <laughs> Man, we're going to pull three of them pews out in the back, build us a nice soundproof room where the mamas can go in. But let me just say ahead of time, that's not the chill-out room. That's not going to be for folks to go in, and we need to talk real quick. So we duck inside the baby room. It's not going to be for that. It'll be for some of these little crumb crunchers around here <laughs> that's trying to compete with the preachers. Now, one of them's my grandson. Amen. So I, 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 have to, I have to play nice. I'm teasing. You know, the sound of babies is the sound of growth. So I don't ever get upset over having babies in the church. It's just something you have to deal with as you grow. And then once we get a soundproof room, we'll keep growing and not have to deal with it. We're almost there, but we're not just quite there yet. All right. Now, last week, we left off on the fact that we can't restore ourselves once we have sinned. And we've got an Old Testament example. We've got some scriptures that give us some light, shed some light on that. And then um, just a couple of things at the end concerning what's important, what needs to come to the pastor and what doesn't. Um, in the book of Isaiah, Chapter number 59. Isaiah 59. And just for a little background before we get started, there was from the time the children of Israel left Egypt, there was this consistent backsliding that they did. I know that I've heard preachers say that they couldn't help themselves because they had been in slavery for more than 200 years. And how do you get that out of people? And they use cliches like, well, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, but he didn't get Egypt out the children of Israel. I'm not going to speculate as to why they did what they did. But one thing I do know is they had more miracles presented to them and God bringing them out of Egypt in one short period of time than anywhere else in the Old Testament. And even with all of those miracles, even when God would punish them for their sin, they would still turn right back around and do wrong again. Now, I'm going to get off script just for a moment. If you go with me to the book of Numbers, I know I said Isaiah 59. Hang on to that because I want to show you the stubbornness of the people to do what God wanted them to do. Numbers chapter number 16. Guess I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I hear me. 
Numbers chapter 16 and verse number 1. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and the Byram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with, censor, or with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. Now, don't forget, there were, there were a lot of them out there in the wilderness. There were millions of them. And it's important to notice here that this wasn't one or two people who had decided that they were going to take over. This was more than 250, and the Bible says, princes of the congregation, men of renown. These were not just vagrants, somebody that just had a wise idea. These were the chief people among the children of Israel. In verse 3 it says, And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. For some reason they took the notion that holiness gave them a right to position. That's not how God does it. Don't get me wrong. God expects holiness from his leaders. God expects holiness from his church. But just because you think you're more holy than someone else in the church does not give you the right to their position. And this is their argument to Moses. You see that we're just as holy as you are. What gives you the right to tell us what to do? It ain't too far off from what we deal with today. A pastor will start a church from scratch. He will labor and labor and labor, going door to door, handing out tracts, handing out cards, slowly building the church. He will work until he's got something that's worth folks saying, hey, I'm going over to this church. Because nobody wants to follow something small. People like to say, yeah, we've got 3,000 people in our church. They like to say things like that. It means that they're really saved because they got so many people that go to their church. You're right, not so. He'll work and work and work until the church is of a sufficient size that it can support a full-time pastor. And then here comes some guy who thinks he's holy and wants to start a rebellion in the church and going to take it over. He ain't labored for nothing. Have knocked on a single door. Handed out one piece of paper with, with the name Jesus on. Ain't done nothing. But I know more and I'm taking over. That happens all the time. So this spirit that you're seeing here is not an isolated incident. These men gather themselves together and they say, we're just as holy as you. Now, let me just, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but let me just say this. If they were so holy, how come they didn't bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? They were in Egypt right along with the rest of them. Now, here's their, here's their claim. Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Well, if that was true, where was you when they was in slavery? 
I'll tell you where they were. They was making bricks right along with everybody else. They were crying to the Lord just like everybody else. Moses comes along, gets them out of Egypt, and God does it by a mighty hand. Now that everything is running along okay, hey, Moses, you taking too much on yourself. Brother, you see, we just as spiritual as you are. God finally had to tell him, if there's any among you that's spiritual, I'll speak to you in dreams and in dark sayings. But as for my servant Moses, I'll speak to him face to face like a man speaks to his friend. Now God is doing something here. He's showing you that it doesn't matter how spiritual you think you are, you do not have the insight that God gives the person that he puts in charge. If I can say it like this, to use a natural kind of example, my wife and I have a child and we want someone to babysit for us. So we get the babysitter and we tell the babysitter, now listen, um, while we're gone, I don't want the children to eat any Rice Krispie treats. We've got company coming over tomorrow and I don't want them to eat the Rice Krispie treats because that's for our company tomorrow. I don't want this to turn into some kind of fight or argument. So, you tell them if they ask you for them Rice Krispie treats, no. Mama and Daddy said no. Don't give them no explanation. Don't go into no details with them. Just tell them I said no. And so the child comes and asks for some Rice Krispie treats. And the babysitter says no. Your mom and dad said no. Well, why? They said no. Well, I don't see why we can't have them. They made them. They never tell us we can't have what we want to eat in this house. And who do you think you are? You're not even my mom. Who do you think you are telling me that I can't have food in this house? It's not your food. But now, that's exactly what people do to God. There are times when God will give his pastor, his preachers, insight into things and says, just tell them I said no. And folks will get mad at the preacher. Why not? I've always felt like we need to have a shoe shining auxiliary in the church. Why can't we have one? Well, God told me that's what my ministry is. Well, all I know is what God told me. God told me the shoe shine ministry needs to be in the church. And if I can't do it here, I'm going someplace where somebody will obey the call of God. People get like that a lot because they feel like God is dealing with them. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I want us to understand there are things that God will tell me as a pastor that he will not tell the congregation. He'll tell me what to tell the congregation. But don't be deceived. There are some things that God tells me and does not tell me why. Because it's none of my business. There are some things he says do and I'm wondering why. It's none of my business. Let, let, let's, let's go on. Now, I want to show you another thing about what these men did to show you the spirit of someone that's got rebellion in their heart. In verse number six, um, actually four, and when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he spake to Korah. Now, now remember that, okay? Now, that's a mark of a true man of God or woman of God. When trouble hit, what did Moses do? Fell out on his face to the Lord. He didn't fight and argue with them, didn't tell them off, didn't get things straight. Now, you know why Moses fell on his face? Because he already knows 
what's coming when you disobey like this. So he's preempting God. He's fallen on his face for these people. And again, a true man or woman of God will not fight, but will seek God. All right. And he spake unto Korah and, unto it, and all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Now, the causing to come near unto him, he's saying, If you're holy, God will allow you to approach to him. Because... At this point, if you was not a, uh, from the tribe of Levi, if you was not a priest, you weren't permitted to go into the tabernacle. You just couldn't do it. But since you're claiming that you are holy and just as holy as everybody else, tomorrow we're going to go to church before the Lord. And if you are as holy as you say you are, you can approach unto the Lord. Isn't that fair? If you declaring how saved you are, isn't it fair that you have a right to go before God? All right. Verse number six, this do take you censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. Moses said, and Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi. Now, he's getting ready to rebuke them. And this is something that pastors have to do all the time. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that God, that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring, to bring you near to himself to do service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and minister unto them. Pastors have to deal with that all the time. You the head usher. But ain't satisfied with that. Now our head usher is. Hallelujah. I see her looking at me. <laughs> Pastors have to deal with that all the time with people who are not satisfied with what they have in the church. They got to do more. They got to be more. They need, people need to see how important I am. Where does that spirit come from? From Lucifer. God made him the archangel. God made him the, the covering cherub. He wasn't satisfied with that. He had to have more. That is one of the things that you can tell when the enemy is dealing with you. How do I know this is me or how do I know this is the Lord? If, if it's you trying to promote yourself, then it's you. Because the Bible says to be sure that your gifts will make room for you. I've been just getting ignored. I know they can hear how I sing when I'm in the congregation. I sing right up front. I know they can hear me. I sit right over by the organist. I know he can hear me singing. I sing in key. I sing on time. I, I, I get the key before he does. And they ain't asked me to sing in the choir. That's because God sees your attitude is wrong. It's not about how good of a singer you are. God don't choose people just because they got talent. God will take a nobody and give them talent. So he don't need your bad attitude. All right. Uh, I'm trying to get to... Let's go to verse 12. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said... We will not come up. 
Now he told them, come on up to the tabernacle and let's have a talk with the Lord. And they said, we're not going anywhere. That's how you can tell the spirit of a rebellious person. They ain't going to let nobody tell them what to do. They're not going to listen to nobody. They're not interested in coming to church and hearing what God has to say. He gave them the opportunity. You say you holy? Okay, let's go talk to the Lord. No, we ain't going to go. Does everybody know the punishment for what they did? Moses um, Moses makes the statement. I'm looking for it real quick. He said, if you die the death of all men, then the Lord was for you. Verse 29. Yes, verse 29. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. It's, too, it's, it's simple. If you keep on living past tomorrow, then God is for you. But if he does a new thing and he kills you, then you know who was on the Lord's side. Verse 31, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them, everything that belonged to them, went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the all the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. Oh, they had quite a crowd. But as soon, now, now they was cheerleading along with them. Soon as God started to hand out punishments, what did they do? Don't think for a second that just because you got a half a dozen folks in the church that think that you should be the one in charge, that when trouble hits, that they're going to stay with you. Oh, no, they'll run quick. Oh, yeah, it, it'll, it'll be over for you. They knew what Moses said. They knew that he declared this would be a new thing. They saw God open the earth and swallow them up and close the earth back on them. They saw that. Let's jump down to verse. Now, let me, let me just show you. What I'm talking about, the reason why I read this is because I want you to see this, how their attitude was every time God demonstrated himself. Verse 41, but on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, ye have killed the people of the Lord. How did they come to that conclusion? How did they think that when that Moses somehow made the earth open up and swallow them up and close the earth back again. Now let me tell you where my mind is, okay? If I thought Moses did that, I would give that man as much distance as I possibly could. I would always be on the fringe of the congregation, just in case, because that would scare me. If I understood that God did it, I'd be praying all the time, Lord, I'm not like them people. Please don't hurt me just because they cutting up. 
I would be. I don't want to be in trouble because you don't want to do right. What did they do? How fresh was this? This is not like 40 years later. How fresh was this? 41. But on the morrow, the very next day, they got up and said, Moses, you have killed the people of God. He just got through telling them, if you die the death of an old age, it's because the Lord was with you. But God's going to demonstrate who's holy and who isn't. And he did. And do you think that they got behind Moses after that? They kept cutting up. Time after time after time. God went through after this. The Lord went through and started killing. And who saved them? Moses. At one point, the Lord said, Moses, stand back. I'm going to kill them all and raise up seed unto you. God had a right to do that. Well, what did Moses do? Don't do this thing, Lord. Don't do this. If you kill them, then your enemies will say, you could bring them out to the wilderness, but you couldn't deliver them. So you killed them in the wilderness. And if you blot their name out of your book, blot my name out too. Moses was a better preacher than I'll ever be. <laughs> if the Lord told me, stand back, I'm about to wipe so-and-so out, I say, how far do I need to get away? <laughs> I'll be praying for you while I'm stepping back. And I'm going to be asking God to have mercy, but I'm going to make sure there's some distance. I want us to see that the, there, was, there was this continual backsliding, continual rebellion against God. They constantly rode against the Lord, constantly challenged God. The Bible says it like this. They tempted the Lord in the wilderness. They kept challenging him. Isaiah 59. Isaiah goes to them. They, now they've been clowning again. They're getting ready to get. Now this is Judah. And they're about to go into captivity for 70 years. They're doing their own thing. And so the Lord sent Isaiah to talk to his people. And you all might be asking me to have mercy. You all might be saying the Lord surely won't put us in bondage. We still have in church. We still coming to church, moving. We we, we dancing in the spirit. We, we're offering up our sacrifices. God won't do this to us. 59 and 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Don't, don't ever think that God's not capable of doing something. Now we will go to the Lord and say, Lord, they found they found cancer. And this is going to be a beautiful testimony. We'll tell him how to do it. This is going to be a beautiful testimony, Lord. If you heal me from this, they'll know that you are real. It is not that God can't. I'll tell you what the problem is. And I'll tell you why so many people go to the televangelists and the radio preachers and the mega pastors and, and, and try to get prayer for some healing and walk away just as sick as when they went up there. i tell you why. Because God made these bodies to die. They're not going to last forever. God made these bodies. Let, let me take that back. I misspoke myself. Sin made these bodies die. 
we are still under the curse of in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die we're still there matter of fact the bible says it is appointed unto man once to die then the judgment it's going to happen and you can fall out and cry and beg God and dare God and challenge God and demand of God. It's not that his arm is too short. It's not. Sin has caused death to enter into the human family. It is not that God does not hear our prayers. If you remember Brother Daniel, he fasted for 40 days, 30 days, 21 days, what it was, 21 days. He fasted. And finally the Lord sent an angel, and, and or the angel appeared to Daniel, and he told him, the Lord heard you the first day you prayed. But the prince of, I think it's the prince of Persia. It's been a, been a while since I've read that. But the enemy hindered. The enemy hindered the angel getting to Daniel. That's a different message altogether. I'm going to leave that alone. But, th but there's some good truths in that. There are some things that we ask God for, and we think God has forgotten all about us. God hasn't forgotten anything. Sometimes the enemy just hinders. But God knows that even though the enemy might hinder, God knows my people will hang on anyway. He knows that. Now, I'm saying there's a whole lot more to that because I don't want us to walk away thinking that God is powerless against the devil because that's not true. There are some things in the way God allows things to happen that test us and prove yeah. us. So I'm just going to leave it at that. It wasn't that God didn't hear Daniel. Heard him the first time he prayed. So, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But, now, here's the thing. If you look at Anybody got a coin? If you look at a coin and you flip it over, you're looking at the opposite side, right? That's what the word but implies, or that's what the word but does when it's in the Bible. Whenever you see but, it means I'm about to show you the other side of it. Here is the first side. God's not saving you. God's not answering your prayers. But let's look at the other side of it. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So why is it that God wasn't answering? What is iniquities? All right, I heard sins and lawlessness. Iniquities, iniquity does mean lawlessness. It means um, that you are disobeying the law that God has established. And a sin is when you know what the target is that God has set and you miss the bullseye. There are some people who attempt to do right and fail to do right. There are some people who are lawless. I ain't going to have nobody telling me what to do. I'm going to do my own thing. I go to church. I pay my tithes and offering. I pray like everybody else. I sing. When they have programs, I do that too. But ain't no man going to tell me what I need to do. That is lawlessness. It's lawlessness because God established church government. Now you can rebel against it if you want to. 
But that means you're violating the law that God established. Sin is when you know I am not supposed to commit adultery. And you do it anyway. That's missing the mark that God has established. Now, don't get me wrong. She might have been real cute. She might have been coming on to you. She might have been saying all the things to you that your wife won't say. So you had a good reason. No. I can see, I can see the sisters getting their purses together. They're getting ready to get up out of here. <laughs> Once you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you got the power now to say no and walk away. No matter how much she's flirting with you, and it don't matter how much your wife won't fix you dinner, you still don't have a right to go cheat. All right, I'll leave it alone. There are some things that we can do that will force God to not listen to our prayers. We still in the book of Isaiah 59? All right, let's read verse number three. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. So, if, if, if we kind of look at this um, in a more modern way, the shedding of blood, we don't, do, do the saints go out and shed people's blood? No, but we'll hurt people on purpose. And here's what we will do. We'll hurt them, and then when somebody says, you shouldn't have said that, we'll say, well, they shouldn't have done this and so. Like, it makes it okay. We will intentionally get somebody in trouble. Well, we'll go, to, here, here's what we will do. We'll go to the pastor. Well, you know, I'm sure you don't know this, but I've seen Sister Lori doing thus and so. And now there's like a whole bunch of saints that don't want to hear her when she gets up and sing, they don't want to hear her because they know she's living a raggedy life, preacher. I know you don't know. Well, what, what do you think God tells his pastors? A lot of times folks come and tell me what they've done, and I knew before they got there. It's not always because God showed me what they did. I would say 99% of the time it's because folks like to do this. They talk, 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 talk. And if I could just throw this in as a sidebar, you ain't doing me any favors by coming to me and telling me, you know, so-and-so said, they can't stand the way you teach. You're not helping me with that. Look, here's what people are thinking. I, I want to I give you some insight. They want to get close to me and prove their loyalty to me, so I'm going to tell you something ugly somebody said about you. Don't do that. Don't do it to anybody else. If somebody dislikes another person in the church, and the person they dislike don't know it, let them go along without any problems in their life. You don't have to inform them of everything. I don't want to know that you don't like me. Deacon Moses said, I don't want to know either. <laughs> I don't want that in my mind. That's another thing that I have to fight. And I don't want that. Why would you put that on somebody else? I had somebody come and tell me one time, you know, I know, and I'm going to use my wife and Deacon Scott since they're sitting right here on the front pew. I 
know that Deacon Scott can't stand Sister Lori. And she's about to do something nice for him. And Pastor, it's taking everything I got inside of me to not say nothing because he's taking advantage of her. Do you know what I tell him? Leave him alone. It's none of your business. Why should she be hindered from doing what she feel is a good thing because you mad at him? And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. I'm mad at him. Now, folks will dress it up. Now, I don't have a problem with Deacon Scott. I just don't like to see the way he's treating Sister Lori. And she's my friend, too. I just don't like that. No, you got a problem with him or you leave it alone. He goes on talking about your fingers with iniquity. I'm using my hands to do things I ain't got no business doing. I'm using my fingers to chop up some crack cocaine. I'm using my fingers to steal some money out the till. I'm using my fingers to touch somebody I ain't got nobody, no business touching. <clears throat> Amen, somebody. I'm using my fingers to break God's law. But I want you to know something. It's not no spur of the moment thing. It doesn't just happen out of the blue. You had to sit and to think. I'm about to do this. You weigh it out in your mind. Is it wrong or is it right? Should I do this or shouldn't I do it? And you go ahead and do it. Then you start to feeling guilty about it. And you come back and say, I don't know what happened. It just out the blue. No, it wasn't. You thought about that. All right. You use your mouth to speak lies. Now, notice what he says. Spoken lies. That's past tense. You've been telling lies. Amen. Muttered perverseness. And perverseness is consistently or constantly doing wrong. Constantly talking about stuff you ain't got no business talking about. It doesn't matter how you dress it up. It doesn't matter how you justify it. You can't go around using your mouth as a weapon to hurt people and think I'm okay with God because we're not. Nobody's calling for justice. And justice means honestly dealing with other people. You know, there's some folks that's always got an angle for something always scheming how they can get the better deal. And yet the Bible tells us to prefer our brothers in honor. We will jip our brother in the church for $10 and then go and pay for the meal of somebody rich because they're rich. Oh, don't think for a second God don't see all of that. Don't think for a second that God doesn't see that you'll do preferable things for people that don't need it. And the ones that do, you're looking down on them. Nobody's pleading for truth. The word pleadeth here is not talking about begging. It is like a legal proceeding, a legal pleading. When you bring something to court, it is a legal pleading, and that's what he was talking about here. Nobody is trying someone in the justice system with truth and fairness. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I don't pay attention. I don't look at who pays what in tithes in the church. I don't do that. I will have the Secretary Treasurer tell me when somebody's not paying, but I don't care what they pay. 
I don't look at it because if somebody that pays a thousand dollars a week in ties is getting into a dispute with someone that's not paying ties at all and they come and want me to settle the dispute if I know that this is a harsh and hard dispute and I tell the person that pays a thousand dollars a week in ties you are wrong and you owe them an apology and I know they got a hot temper they might leave if I tell them that and go get their money somewhere else who do you think I'm going to judge in favor of? You know what my answer is going to be? Well, no, 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 no. Let's calm, let's calm things down. I don't want that. I want to be able to judge fairly. And I don't want my judgment clouded by things that are not important. How much you pay in tithes and offering is not important to me. If you don't pay, you're stealing from God, not me. They trusted in vanity. Things that have no value. I trust my car. I trust my job. I trust my house. I trust my alarm company is going to keep me safe. If somebody break up in this house, the alarm company's got them. You ever see them commercials on TV? Ring.com. And somebody, the alarm goes off and the light flicks on and they got their cell phone right out. Can I help you? <laughs> well, let, I, let me give you some reality on that. It takes you a little time to get your phone out, to get it turned on, to get that app opened, for it to sync, bring everything in. By the time that light has come on and whoever it was sneaking up to your house, they already in it. You can't put your trust in that kind of stuff. If you leaving and going away to work and you scared somebody going to break in your house, pray and plead the blood of Jesus on your house. Put your trust in that. I'm not telling you don't get no alarm, but don't put your confidence in it. I lock my car doors, but I don't have no confidence in that because somebody can get a rock and break the window. Then he goes on and he brings us into the present tense. Speak lies. Now, you, you have spoken lies. Now he said you speak lies. You ain't learned from your past. You've been telling lies and evidently you still telling them. And when he says you conceive mischief, always got something going on. Always looking how you can do something bad. Now, he's laying out some pretty heavy stuff here that they had did. And sometimes people will come and say, well, do I need to confess that? Well, evidently the Holy Ghost is dealing with you. I said this before and I'm going to say it again. We are not Catholic the purpose of coming and confessing is not for you to just be clear right now so you can go out and do it again but you don't want too much of it piling up behind you so I just make sure I just confess regularly because let me tell you what's going to happen you're going to get yourself blocked by God and once he turns on you there's nothing nobody can do Moses knew what they were doing and he defended them and God still killed a whole bunch of them don't think that because the pastor's praying for you that that means that you can just go do what you want and then go confess it later. Well, let's, look, let's get a scripture. 1 John chapter 1. Because I know I'm in the Old Testament. I want us to see this is not just Old Testament. This is in the New Testament too. 1 John chapter 1. And verse number nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all I got to do is just keep confessing, right? 
That's what he said. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right. I think it's in the book of Proverbs. I can't remember. I'm going to quote it. Whosoever confesseth and forsaketh. You can't just keep on doing wrong. Paul addressed it this way in the book of Romans. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Now, he doesn't leave it at just that. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. How are you going to keep on living in sin and you dead to sin? How many in here are scared to walk in a graveyard at night? Got quite a few folks. Now, I, I read the news and I watch the news and I'm going to let y'all in on a little secret. Now, I hope you don't leave from here and go up to the graveyard. I've never seen it reported in the news that a dead person ever hurt anybody. I never heard that. Might have hurt their feelings. Say what? Until they die? Oh, no, I don't mean hurt feelings. I mean really hurt you. You ain't never heard of nobody dead robbing anybody. Nobody read, nobody dead ever pulled out a gun and shot somebody and said, I know I'm dead, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> they didn't do that. How many ever heard of a dead person telling somebody off? They don't do that. Now they like to do this in the movies. You think they dead? Their eyes are closed and they just lay in there. And some dummy <laughs> will go and hover right over their face to see. Are they really dead? And while they're there, they'll reach up and grab them by their throat. But it's not because they're dead. It's because they faking like they're dead. Once you're good and dead, you ain't bothering with nobody. How can you who are dead dead to sin live any longer in sin how can you do that I tell you how cause something resurrected that's how we say we say we say we on fire for Jesus we say we love everybody we'll go into restaurants and don't even know people I love you proving that we love everybody Listen, saints, don't do that. <laughs> That's not what the Bible's talking about when it says to love your neighbor and love your enemy. You don't mean, you, you, you know, I've heard people say, I love everybody in the world. And one guy said, even folks in China? He said, yep. He said, you don't even know anybody in China. <laughs> and you're talking about you love them. That's because we're taking things out of context and applying them incorrectly. I ain't going to deal with love. If y'all let me go over just a little bit, I want to get through this so we can see. Let me give you one more example in the book of Joshua, chapter number six or seven. And besides, I've only been up here for 54 minutes. So y'all need to talk to the devotion leader. I, I, I get an hour. I'm supposed to get an hour to teach. All right, I'm teasing. <laughs> Joshua chapter 7, verse number 6. And Joshua rent his clothes. Now, let me, just real quick, let me give you some, some background. They had just went and conquered Jericho. Now they went to Ai and got whooped handily. And they don't know why. 
And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until eventide. This man's having some prayer service. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. Now, isn't that the solution to everything? Praying? That's what we think. Ain't nothing wrong with praying. There's something wrong with not praying. But is prayer the answer to everything? All right, well, let's look. Go down to verse number 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. This ain't time for prayer, brother. Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou upon, or wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? What are you doing down praying? Israel hath sinned. So now if prayer fixed it, then Joshua's prayer should have fixed it. What did the Lord tell him? Get up. Why are you down here praying and there's sin in the camp? You got some work to do, brother. They have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own Stuff. God is saying this plural. They have done this. And they have done that. Isn't he? And there were some of the children of Israel that not, they didn't just get chased away from the fence. Some of them got killed. Jump down to verse number 16. We go through a weeding out process. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken and he brought the family of Judah and took from uh, and he took the family of Zarhathites the Zarhites rather the Zarhites and he brought the family of Zarhites man by man and Zabdi was taken and he brought his household man by man and Achan the son of Carmi the son of Zabdi the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give I pray thee glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him. Now, so all you got to do is tell the Lord, right? Right. Got to keep reading. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Oh, yes. You're going to have to apologize to God. But you need to tell too. Don't hide it. Don't cover up what you've done. And let, let me tell you here, he tells us how it should be done too. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. You're not confessing by coming in and say, Pray for me. I, I, I did something wrong. Just, just pray for me. That is not a confession. Some folks think that, yeah, I mean, listen, I understand it's embarrassing. And I don't want anybody to think for a second that I'm interested in taking anybody's confession. I'm just as uncomfortable as you are. I don't like that. You know why? Because I've had to do it enough times that I know how embarrassing it is. But you don't get to come in before the Lord and the preacher and say, I sinned, pray for me. No, I sinned. I stole a pack of gum from the store. And I knew I shouldn't have done it. And then I'll tell you, amen, go back up to the store and pay for it. Sometimes I just have to pray for it. Some things can't be remedied like that. But you can be sure. I'm praying and I'm asking God to give me an answer. I have folks confessing to me and I'm praying while they're confessing. How do I deal with this, Lord? What do I say? I don't want to I don't want to deal with it no more than I have to. And I'm not walking around. One thing the Lord has blessed me with is a bad memory. I've had folks come back and tell me, "Well, you know when I confessed about this?" No, I don't. I don't remember. I think that's a good thing. I'm not walking around looking at folks that uh -huh, I ain't forgot what you did. 
God wouldn't put me in this position if that was my personality, if that was my attitude. He wouldn't put me here for that. I tell you what, that's a good way to get yourself in trouble with God. And you can be assured I wouldn't have anybody sitting in judgment with me that I felt was had a wrong spirit, was going to go back out and tell, go tease them, go play with them about it, that's going to mess with them. If I felt like that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't hear nothing. Now, we'll, I'm, I'm going to get into church government coming up here in the following weeks, and we'll deal with the helps that God has had put in the church, deacons and elders and other helps in the church, and how he established that, why he established it, and the helps that it gives to the church itself. Because the pastor is just a servant, isn't he? You know, what, you know what the scripture says? I'm, I'm, a servant of, I'm a servant of the people, right? So y'all can just tell me what to do and I got to do it. No. I'm a servant of the Lord to the people. Whatever he tells me I got to do, I don't get to fight and complain about it. I got to do it. And sometimes the Lord says, make peace with somebody that's not even peaceable with you. You the pastor, make peace with them. That's a hard pill to swallow, but I'm his servant. I don't get to choose what I want to do and not do. All right. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. She said, what is the significance of putting dust on their heads? They were, they were giving an example of how low they felt. They were below the dirt. That, that's how bad off they were. They threw dust on their head and showed that they were below they were below the dust. Yes, sir. All right, his question is when God showed Achan or Joshua the sin that Achan had done, does that mean is that a kind of an example of God showing me what people do? If you go back and look at it, he didn't tell Achan. He didn't tell Joshua who did it or what was done. He just said there's sin in the camp and you need to find out who's in sin. So he didn't tell his business. God knew it, but Achan had to tell it. So when the word finds you, I might know. I, I, there's times I look at people and I'm saying, something's wrong with them. They're not right. Something's not right. It's not that God told me that you've been stealing. He's just showing me something's not right with you. And there have been folks I've pulled off to the side and said, is everything okay? And they break down and start crying. No, I did this, that, and the other. I didn't know what they did. I just know they had done something. Does that make sense? Okay. No, God is not a gossiper. He's not going to tell me people's business. But he will make you tell it and get prayer. Yes, sir. His question was, um, when Moses was talking to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and he told them, let's all get our censers and let's go to the house of the Lord, to the tabernacle before the Lord, would God have listened to them and given them a second chance? Uh, absolutely not. No, he wouldn't have talked with them. He already established the fact. I'll deal with the preachers, the priest, with, with dark sayings and dreams that are hard to be understood. He established that and he said, but Moses, I'll talk to. So that was one of those situations where they were wrong, and they knew it. That's why they didn't want to go to church. Let me say this. No, he said Moses must have known that they wasn't going to come. Let me say this. I can't, I, the Bible doesn't really tell us what Moses was thinking. However, Moses had enough sense to know, let's go to the Lord with this. And had they done it in ignorance, thinking that they were right, they would have went to church because they thought they were right. If you're claiming to be a preacher, why are you avoiding church? You a priest, but you don't want to come to the tabernacle? You know why? Because you know that Aaron's two sons put fire and lit the censers, the incense, with strange fire and fire come down out of heaven and devour them up. Now I ain't going over there. 
But they still had a wrong attitude too. Once you get a wrong spirit, you do things that don't even make sense. Does that answer your question? All right. Anything else? All right. Stand on your feet.